uh, our guest speaker. Oops. Our guest speaker tonight is Taj um, Salam, and I'm sure Taj will give us a little bit of a background on on the subject area and on what his work is when we start. Um, the session really is, 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 is aimed to reflect how Unite members and branches can campaign for a better transport infrastructure in the light of this climate emergency. Um, and our agenda will, will take the format tonight of uh, Taj will give us, uh, say, 10, 15 minute talk on, on, on the subject area. This will follow up by a question and answer session uh, from yourselves, roughly about 20 to 30 minutes. And I ask, um, while, while, we, while Taj is speaking, to put yourselves on mute. Um, and then when you want to come in for the question and answer, uh, Clark, Clark will be taking that over for us. So if you just put your electronic hand up or or make yourself known. Um, when you do come in, just just say where you're from, your name, uh, and and the area you you unite branches in. After that, we'll have a, we'll come back and we we'll um, conclude the session. However, um, if you wish, we can extend this over uh, for further discussion and perhaps in the in your own areas. So you know uh, we can we can set up. A breakout rooms for you. So if you wanted to discuss anything any further after the session, we can continue with that. Um, so, so ideally, what we want to come away with tonight is some sort of aims and objectives as a caucus. We can start working on for future meetings or, or as, as as a caucus. How do we influence other people? I think that that will be enough for me for now. So, Taj, over to you. John, thank you very much. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, hi, Sylvia. I picked you up from my neck of the woods. Uh, I'm just sat down from uh, about three miles, four miles from you. Um, uh, my name is Taj Salam. I'm the uh, chair of Passenger Industrial Sector Committee for Unite the Union. Um, so I chair the, the, the NISC uh, for, for, for short abbreviation. I'm also the... Um, uh, steering committee member for ETF. Um, so I sit on the uh, Urban Public Transport Committee for European Transport Federation, uh, and I'm on their steering committee. Um, other roles, I'm a branch secretary at First Bradford Bus Depot. Um, I'm also on the uh, regional committee for, for uh, Yorkshire and Humber region. And I'm also on the uh, national uh, the, the TUC National uh, Transport Federation. I also sit on the uh, West Yorkshire Combined Authority Transport Committee, which is actually very, very crucial. And, and, and I'll go into that a little bit as to, because when John was introducing, he was actually talking how uh, branches and, and community members, and I've got to applaud everybody who's, who's a community member here because the marvelous work that uh, you guys do. Uh, day in day out is is absolutely appreciated by many people because some of us actually concentrate on workplace branches, but as a community branches, you guys have a more uh, a, a sort of uh, interaction with with caucus groups, with passenger groups, with uh, with with others, and I think that is really really vital for for a lot of us who actually understand what the climate justice is and what climate emergency is at this moment of time. And and I think uh, you know I've got to be absolutely honest. Uh, you know the trade unions, especially Unite, are asking for a work-related uh, transition from our current economy to a green economy. But has there been you know a real sort of uh, campaign on on this issue? I'm not really sure that there has been because I think we have actually lacked in that that area a little bit. We talk, uh, I mean, you know, whenever we get an opportunity, we try to actually highlight the issue. Whatever, you know, I mean, we are given a platform on this 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 matter, we we do actually talk. And and but as a union ourselves, we haven't developed something that we could actually take out there and 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 get support for and 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 campaign for. Um, you know, 
we've got to shift away from our reliance on uh, polluting fuels uh, and towards the cleaner, more cleaner and, and energy sources. But that brings its own challenges, to be honest with you, you know what I mean? Uh, and, and because we are members in the energy sector, so we've got to be careful, you know, I mean, how what the campaigns are developed, uh, just as we are members in nuclear sector. And, you know, when we are talking about new, nuclear disarmament, we, 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 we actually tend to not go 100% on that. So therefore, but, the, you know, we have to balance things. And we've got to talk about climate emergency and climate justice, because that needs action now because if we want to save our planet and leave something that you know our children and grandchildren can enjoy in the future then we've got to do that you know we've got to have action on that hence unite has been calling for decarbonization of our workplaces industries and society the creation of green society must mean a socially just equal society and we talk about social, you know, I mean, just transition. And when we first started talking about just transition, not many people understood what just transition was, you know. And I think all we're asking for is that we have a seat at the table, that we have an input, that when we are actually talking about just transition, it's just not about profits anymore. It's not just about one thing, but it's we carry everybody together. And guarantee of uh, protection of jobs of the current workers and to ensure that all new jobs are good jobs, the right to decent work. I think that is very, very important also. We've got to do that. You know, we have talked about climate emergency and I've, I've said, you know I mean? We've done a very good talk on that, but there is not any real campaigns. And I think that is something that all of us have to get together and we've got to tackle that. We have concentrated, uh, I mean, in the passenger sector, I mean, you know, I'll be honest with you, we have concentrated more on automation and digitalization because that's the real, you know, danger to our members in, in, in the passenger sector because they're talking about automation of buses, digitalization, of, you know, 80% of our, uh, our, our job is now digitalized. You know, we are governed by, by technology 80% uh, of our time. There's only about 20% where we make a decision. Everything else, the, all the decisions are made for us. So therefore, you know, automation is something that's going to wipe out, you know, 80,000, 90,000 jobs overnight if we are not careful. So we've actually concentrated a lot uh, on, on uh, automation and digitalization. However, that does not mean that we can't talk about climate emergency and climate justice. Because, I mean, I've I've just you know been to Brussels last week uh, to the ETF meeting. We talked about uh, climate emergency. We talked about the European uh, you know uh, uh, laws that are actually being sort of uh, reconsidered here in the UK by December. The the government wants to actually uh, you know what I mean just wipe out every single European law and rewrite all the laws that they're actually. Uh, that, that we've been enjoying over the, over the years, and there's a grave danger that there, a lot of stuff will be lost in the in, in the translation. Uh, and 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 I was in South Africa uh, in March at the ITF conference uh, uh, for transport, and there we you know we talked about climate emergency, we talked about greener jobs, we talked about you know whether electric is good or hydrogen is good. And I think that's that's something that is still sort of under discussion. Is it electric? Is it is it hydrogen? At this moment of time, I mean, it's all electric. Going forward, we might be looking at hydrogen, but electric. And we want, you know, a lot of the bus depots or, or the bus manufacturers are going for electric buses, manufacturing electric buses. Um, and a lot of the operators are actually buying electric buses. But the problem lies is that the operators do not want to invest in greener buses unless they're forced to. And that's where the problem lies. It's not about, you know, that we want to save our economy, uh, our, our, our climate. We want to save our planet. Let's go for electric buses because one, electric buses are not fully tested yet. 
the batteries are not really, really, uh, you know, the, the, the operators are not comfortable that how long the battery is going to last. And, and so therefore, the buses that we've got at this moment of time are only a small number. I mean, last week we were talking about how many coaches are actually registered in the whole of Europe, which are electric. And there's only 800 in the whole of Europe that has actually been uh, uh, registered. And also electric, uh, you know, conversion to electric buses actually brings its own challenges. Because if you look at every single footprint of the depots that we've got in the UK at this moment of time, there will only be a handful of depots that can accommodate all electric buses. Currently, for argument's sake, in Bradford, we have nearly 200 buses. And when you come on a night, when they're all in, they are parked so close to each other that you can't even walk. You know, you have to go sideways between the buses to get into a bus. If every single bus was changed over to electric, we would have to actually either expand the depot because if to put the electric points in there, you have to have more space because you have to go through between the buses. Now, currently we have some buses in Leeds, which is about 10 to 12 buses. We have about 10 to 12 buses in Bradford that are electric, but those are actually the charging points are against the fences or the walls. So they just back the buses up and they just plug them in. Whereas 200 buses, you would have to put, you know I mean, charging points in, 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 in all over the depot. It also then brings the, the, the point of, what about the electricity supply? And the electricity supply, you would have to have, you know what I mean, bigger and, 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 and more comprehensive electricity supply. Some places you might even need substations. So therefore, you know, for that change, everybody is either, if they're forced into the change, they'll, 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 they'll make the change. If they're not forced into the change, they won't make the change. And that's where the problem actually lies for us. Many cities, just like Bradford, many cities have actually, you know, I mean, implemented clean air zones. That seems good, you know, that we're taking some action. However, that only, that clean air zone, I mean, Sylvie will, will know that in Bradford, the clean air zone is only for, for heavy goods and, and, and public transport and taxis. All the private cars, no matter what private car you drive, you can still drive in, in, in the city center and everywhere in the clean zone without any restriction. That is not good. Because if we want change, we have to change. And we have to change, you know what I mean, seriously. And we have to take that very, very seriously. I mean, to address the climate emergency, we need significant model shift as well as a zero emission fleet. And that's what we should be campaigning for. And that's what we have been campaigning for. I mean, in Bradford, we've got better buses, you know, I mean, better bus uh, uh, committee uh, at the West Yorkshire Combined Authority. And when I talked about combined authority, we as a union can't go to the employer here and say, we want all the buses changing over to electric. We can't make that decision. We, we will not be able to influence as much as the local authority or the combined authority. So when I sit on the... Uh, West Yorkshire Combined Authority uh, Transport Committee, that's where I actually always talk about the uh, Green Deal, the, the, you know, the, the electric buses. And then, then we talk about hydrogen. But hydrogen for me at this moment of time is, is, is nobody's sure which one, you know what I mean? The gray is out of question. The blue is, 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 is not gonna benefit us. So there's only the green uh, hydrogen that we actually would be benefiting from. But that, the production, production of that hydrogen is very, very, very small number. It's about 5%. And you know, I was, I, I, I was, I was doing my research and I came across, uh, you know, over 125 years ago, there was a, 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 an author called Julius Verne. And he told us about green hydrogen because he mentioned in his uh, novel, The Mysterious Island, I don't know whether anybody's read it or not. I haven't certainly read it, but I've, 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 that's what the quote that I came across. And he, uh, what he said was, and what will they burn instead of coal? Water, water decomposed into a primitive element by electricity will one day be employed as fuel. But we still haven't managed 
to turn what the author related about this form of renewable energy and of the production of green hydrogen into a reality. We haven't done that. Today, fossil fuels are still part of our daily lives. And industrial development, achieving you know, sustainable future uh, depends on us bringing about an energy transition, committing to renewable energies and fuels such as green hydrogen. If we don't do that, I think you know, there's a grave danger that we are actually you know, I mean, gonna be suffering for a very, very, very long time. However, there are barriers for, 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 for the production of the green uh, hydrogen. The current pr production, like I said, was about 5%. And it's, it's actually, you know what I mean, mainly uh, uh, taken from natural gas and coal, which together represents about 95%. That's where the green hydrogen comes from. Uh, so therefore, I think, you know, for me, I think the trade union, just like throughout the pandemic, we were at the forefront of actually, you know, protecting communities, protecting people, protecting workers, making sure that, you know, all the health and safety was adhered to, all the PPE was actually provided for. I think in the same way, I think the trade unions have to wake up to this fact that we have to de deal with this issue and have to deal with it as, a, as, as an emergency. I mean, our branches at local level and our community branch members are doing a great job joining forces with passenger groups. I mean, you know, we go down to uh, all sorts of different meetings uh, of passenger groups, trade trade councils, area activist committees where, you know, I mean, people actually uh, 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 come and talk about climate emergency. However, union nationally, like I said, are a bit lacking in this, uh, this issue and we have not seen much activity in this field. I don't know whether anybody's seen the TUC report on public transport fit for climate emergency. You know what I mean? It's a great read. You know what I mean? It does give a lot of good ideas and, and, and highlights a lot of the issues. And what it says in there is that the transport sector is the biggest problem because it's the biggest polluter at this moment of time. And, and, and this sector, it clearly says, has failed to reduce climate, uh, da, uh, you know what I mean, uh, damaging emissions. Why is that? Because, because the investment needed into public transport has lacked for many, many years. And I think that's where the real problem also lies, that there isn't a real desire by the, by the government to actually invest in public transport. It's like hand to mouth. I mean, we've seen it through the pandemic. It's like being, it's like hand to mouth for, for, you know, bits given here and bits given there and bit given here and bits given there. There isn't a real desire. It's, it, and, 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 you know, nobody has actually sort of come out from the, from the governing uh, uh, parties and, and, and said that we will invest this much money into it because nobody can put a figure on it at this moment in time. But this report does actually, this report does actually put a figure on it. It realistically talks about what is really needed, but it also talks about what reduction, uh, need of the reduction in passenger uh, uh, drivers and, and, and passengers in private cars. And it says about 47 billion uh, uh, kilometers need to be uh, shifted from cars to 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 public transport. That is a massive number, to be honest with you. And for that, you need a fit for purpose uh, public transport. If we don't have a fit for purpose public transport at this moment of time, a lot of the transport companies are in private hands. It's all about profit. There's nothing about passenger need. So therefore, if we're going to have a green and, 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 and purposeful uh, public transport that actually protects the environment, but also serves the very people that it's actually designed for. It also talks about 120% or more bus tram passenger uh, kilometers and 80 more rail passenger, 80% uh, more uh, uh, rail passenger kilometers uh, to be converted from private cars into, into you know, and people coming on to public transport. Now, that is a very aspirational sort of, you know, ask. Because 
many of the people that we talk to, they're saying the, the, the public transport is not fit for purpose. And I think, you know, I mean, that has to be, a to, you know, the report does give by 2030, there should be 7.5 billion pound per year for buses, 7.5 billion. I don't think we've had more than a, you know, 500,000, 500 million in, 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 in funding uh, to the, uh, to the uh, uh, buses in, uh, throughout the pandemic. For 7.5 billion is needed if we want a proper public transport uh, uh, for, for, for the very people that need it. It also talks about, I mean, if you look at the nine regions that they've actually done a, a, an, an, an analysis on, the investment that is needed is about 18.8 billion. And the return on that or the growth in GDP actually, you know, very much outweighs it. It's 52.1 billion growth in GDP. That's 23.3 billion per year growth. I mean, where do we not see sense in that? Creating greener jobs, you know, proper investment in public transport. And, and I think that's where, you know, we as, as, as groups uh, of, of working class people in, 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 you know, I mean, in many of the regions have to get together and, and make sure that we actually talk about the environment and, and, and talk about climate uh, justice at every opportunity. John, I hope that gives you some idea of what we face and what the problems are and what the solution, where the solution lies and what action is needed. I hope, you know, that is something, I hope that's, that's what you wanted me to cover. If there is anything else, I'm more than happy to, to, to sort of, you know I mean, touch on it. No, that's, that's excellent, Taj. That's, that's really good. Thank you. And uh, I'm sure everybody else would uh, support everything you've said there. So I'd like to hand over now to Clara, who will open up the question and answer session. Thanks, John, and thanks, Taj. I mean, this was, you know, really good sort of overview and introduction to our discussion. Um, so, yeah, now for the next 20 to 30 minutes, you know, we want to hear from the participant. I mean, obviously, Taj, you'll have the opportunity to come back on some of the points. So we'll invite people to use the electronic hands uh, to indicate you would like to come in. Uh, or you can also put some questions uh, in the chat if you prefer to do it in that format. Um, we're not just necessarily looking for questions for Taj because you know he has got the answer to everything. We also want to hear from you as Unite members and rep about campaigns that you know you may have been involved in your local areas uh, and maybe some collaboration. I think. You know, Taj mentioned about uh, the fact that, you know, some of the campaign have been involving passenger groups or other, you know, sort of community groups. So that'd be quite good to, to hear about that. Um, I've got a number of hands coming up and I've got a question, but I'm going to wait for mine and see uh, what others have got to say. Um, okay, so I can't remember in what order that was, so I'm going to take them by three and see where we go. So I'm gonna start with um, Angela and then I'm gonna take Terry and Ellen. So Angela, <laughs> would you like to start? And please do remind us, you know, which branch you're from, which area you are based in. Um, hi all, uh, Taj, I thought that was really, really useful. And it's just actually so, it's so encouraging to hear you know, people in the United actually talking about things like nuclear, particularly you know, hydrogen. Um, <coughs> sorry, hey, I'm in the United Community West of Scotland branch, and I'm on the United uh, Area Activist Committee for Ayrshire, so that includes industrial. Uh, it was just a number of things. Half of it was a query, half of it was just what I tell you know, off the top what I saw. Um, I mean, I think we've, we've got to. To be aware that I said, you know, people in Unite were in a in climate activists in Unite were in a unique position. Well, apart from the GMB, because with things like hydrogen, nuclear, I mean, we are at the forefront of the energy generation across the board. But a lot of the solutions might be really, really controversial. But so you know, we are, you know, 
We're, we get flack now for fossil fuels. We're going to get flack in the future for anything that we suggest, but I think we can take it. Um, and that's why I think that we need to be clear uh, as activists, as members, on the politics, the agenda, the sort of scientific knowledge and argument around these things. Um, I'm primarily thinking about Unite Combines. So I know there's one for buses. Um, I've been talking uh, to people up here about the new Lucas plan, which is for aviation, uh, which also incorporates Rolls-Royce uh, and Shannon that make the engines. Um, I'm thinking about, you know, when we're talking about, you know, so I think the combines, it's, it's essential that if, if we are members, in, you know, in those sectors, that we are active in those combines. That's, that's you know, that's what Unite are pushing. I'm thinking about all the sort of, you know, sort of old fossil fuel industries. Um, and I'm thinking that some of, you know, the potential for repurposing, maybe, maybe the oil rigs offshore, well, Scotland and wind, and the amount of offshore wind farms you could get. I mean, up there, it's like, you know, a four to eight gales of breeze to them. I'm thinking about carbon capture and storage. So, you know, there may be sort of, you know, if, if it's possible to, to repurpose uh, different sites. Enios, for example, uh, Enios during the pandemic repurposed part of the oil refinery. Uh, to you know, to produce other things, and I think you know maybe you know, as long as we're knowing, um, I don't know if it includes Coventry Robin. To be honest, I've always just heard Ben Shinnan, but it will, it will. If it's engine, if it's aircraft manufacture, it will. Um, I just think you know that it's also important for how Unite actually works with and put pressure on governments. Um, so whereas I know that you know sort of, you know sort of. In Scotland, you know, that the energy policies are consistent. Um, for example, right, the Scottish government have come up with, they're all good talk, they're just transitioning, you know, I might, I'll put some links in the chat to show you what, what they are, but they actually aren't backing it up. And this is where I think Unite is crucial. They've come up with this decision that, for example, crofters in the Highlands and the Western Isles uh, are not allowed to use peat anymore for fuel. Which is bloody ridiculous. They've used it for centuries, so they, you know that just means they're going to have to rely more on what fossil fuels. That's silly, but um, so I think you know we need to be clear as well. I think we should be calling for the renationalisation of buses, uh, for a real nationalisation of railways. Uh, Scot the Scottish government already run Scott Rail, uh, ferry, uh, for example, Calmac up in Scotland, you know, I mean, these are lifelines for communities. And, you know, even looking at airports, uh, for example, the Scottish government uh, already owns Presswick Airport. So I'm kind of thinking these are some of the things that we could be sort of thinking towards. And it's probably actually, you know, and it's really positive that as you know, you know, as activists in the United, I think, you know, we are getting a voice now. People are actually listening to us. So I think we should keep going. Thank you. Thank you, Angela, for uh, your contribution. And I think I said I was going to take Terry next and then Ellen. Thanks, Clara. Uh, Terry Conway, Chair of Hackney and Islington Unite Community. Uh, we had a big campaign locally um, with Unite members around defence of our local bus services, which got a lot of community support because in London there were proposals to cut a lot of bus routes um, because of the lack of government funding and the original proposals that were put forward by TfL by Transport for London were appalling. Um, they'd done no work about the most used routes and a lot of the routes that they proposed to cut were in the most deprived working class communities, would have cut off people from local hospitals, local schools, and would have, have a particular impact on older and disabled people who wouldn't have been able to get to places 
and also fears for women's safety because people would have had to change buses, including at night. Um, and we were successful in defending some of those routes and it was quite an important campaign. Um, it was difficult to raise that much around climate justice within the campaign, but it is clear, as Taj said, that the question of getting people out of cars is dependent on having a transport system fit for purpose. And obviously, those of us who live in big cities are just off than people, and my computer's doing strange things, people who live in rural areas. And I think the whole question of plans for rural transport are really important. I just wanted to ask one question. I was looking at some of the European stuff, which is a bit difficult to understand. One of the things that has excited me in terms of things that have been going on in other parts of Europe is the introduction of free free public transport in a number of European cities, um, which seems to me is one important way of getting people out of cars, because if it doesn't cost you uh, to use the bus or the train, but it does cost you to use your car, particularly in the cost of living crisis, that seems to me to be a good way to get working class people out of cars. And But reading reading the thing very quickly, it sounded like there was stuff about race to the bottom and I couldn't quite understand what was being argued there. So I'd be interested in you coming back on that. Thanks. Thanks, Terry. And, you know, Tash, feel free to come back on some of the points when I bring you back or not, because I know that you may not have the answer to everything. I'm going to take Ellen and see uh, where we are then. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, thanks to Taj. I found that really interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, it's very clear that there's kind of two sides to this whole um, question of uh, public transport in the um, as, 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 as part of decarbonisation. One side being actually getting people out of their cars by developing a really excellent and accessible and comprehensive public transport system, you know, lots of the reasons that Terry's just talked about, um, um, and the other being the actual technologies that we use in our public transport. And I was really interested that you had a bit more to say about that, because I'm realising actually that we have rather a lot of campaigns on the ground that are ar around accessibility, but not so much about the technologies. Now, the accessibility clearly is very important and Unite Community Branches, I'm, I'm in the Leeds Unite Community Branch, by the way, Leeds, Leeds Wakefield and, and York, and it covers, so just next door to, to um, where Taj is. Um, but yeah. um, so the, there's obviously there's the Better Buses campaign, which, um, which campaigns for um, the combined authority to have control over the, the bus routes and the, uh, and, uh, through the franchising system, um, but is not currently campaigning for public ownership. I think that if we had a bigger campaign um, through the union, then it could be possible to camp start campaigning for a public transport service as opposed to um, a privatised franchise system. But that's yeah, that's 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 one question. Um, <clears throat> but and we've got campaigns not just on accessibility for buses, of course, but there's all the uh, campaigns around guards on trains, um, uh, staffed ticketing officers for trains, the location of taxi ranks. I mean, in York has got a campaign that blue badge holders are not allowed to park in the city centre. And they've got a campaign against that because it's obviously, you know, quite outrageous in terms of uh, disabled access. So all of those things, I think, are really important. But on the... Um, we, but there does tend to be a little bit of a disconnect between when we're campaigning for accessible public transport, we pay lip service to the idea that it's essential to get those emissions down, <clears throat> to make it, make it accessible, but also, yes, to you know, acknowledge that some people will always need to use other forms of transport. Um, and yeah, we pay lip service to it without getting into the nitty gritty of what that means. And I think, Taj, you've, you've started to do that um, in, in, this, in this introduction. 
Um, I think the, the question of hydrogen, yeah, well, really what interested me was you, you flagged up a difficulty in terms of being members of UNITE. Uh, UNITE currently has its, its um, balanced energy policy, which essentially, as we've, we've all discussed before, it's, um, it, it's, um, it's basically it's not opposed to the continuation of, of fossil fuels. <clears throat> and I think, as you've hinted, that if we move to a hydrogen based transport system, it won't be green hydrogen predominantly because that's so inefficient in terms of the, the, the use of renewable, renewably produced energy it will just actually block the decarbonisation of the energy system if we start diverting it into uses like, like transport. So therefore we're ending up with blue hydrogen, which depends on carbon capture, which doesn't work with anything like the efficiency that we need it to work and is basically continuing fossil fuels. But if we really get into the campaigning around that, we, yeah, we do have to take on our union policies and we have to, we have to grasp that nettle. <clears throat> I'll leave it there for now, thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, at this stage, I'm going to check with you, Taj. Did you want to come back on any of the points? I mean, you don't have to if you don't want <laughs> no, to. No, no, no. I, I mean, uh, yeah, definitely. Well, uh, you know, I mean, well, I've got the opportunity. I will do. Uh, I mean, Angela, but yeah, uh, United has actually now started using um, a lot of its resources towards the combines. And they put a lot of resources in there. And what it is, is, I mean, the combines are to make sure that everybody actually is uh, under one banner, which is uh, passenger transport. And, uh, you know, I can only talk about uh, passenger transport. We've got it in uh, road, road and logistics. We've got it in health. Uh, but the passenger transport, what we used to do, Angela, is we used to meet separately. So, you know, you've got the eight big bus companies so you've got Arriva, you've got national express you've got stagecoach you've got first and, and and the likes of it and they all used to meet separately so first group people met separately Arriva met separately and then from there they would actually send one or two delegates to the uh, industrial sector committee and what we've taken a decision and I, I mean i've campaigned for it for a very long time to have something that actually brings everybody under one one roof and that's what we are doing now is we're bringing everybody from every single company whether it's municipals whether it's you know i mean armlets companies whether it's coaches whether it's taxis or whether it's uh, uh, buses we want to bring all those people together and campaign on real issues but not in a fragmented sort of uh, environment uh, you also talked about aviation. I mean, you know, I, I've seen some of the manufacturers of airplanes talking about going uh, green. The problem is, you know, if you're on the ground and something goes wrong, you're okay. But when you're in the air, it's got to be absolutely, you've got to be 110% sure that that engine is not going to cut out or that fuel is not going to, block something uh, uh, as Helen was saying or, or, or the battery is not going to run out so therefore I think that is you know way down the line in, 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 in my in my opinion. I was asked the question by TUC because there was a consultation by uh, Labour Party as to what would be the two main issues that we would like to actually highlight in their manifesto and, and two things I've asked for. One is renationalization of buses. And I think we should be talking about renationalization of all public transport. And, 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 and also I've asked for a national uh, bus pension scheme. Because if you have a look, we've got a lot of the mayors now being installed in a lot of the cities. And the problem that you've got is that they're all going to be started to move towards franchising. And where franchising, you're moving from one employer to the other or one operator to the other because the the, the current uh, route uh, 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 that they actually put up for tender are three years with an option of two-year extension to maximum of five years. So if I was in that environment in franchising, I would actually be working for about nearly uh, seven to eight different employers if my contract changed every time or my route changed every time because I've been in the industry for nearly 35 years. 
So I would be worth 36 years, this is now. So therefore, but those are the two main things that I've put in, in the, uh, the, the manifesto for labor is renationalization of buses and national pension scheme. I mean, Terry, I think you're absolutely right. Throughout the pandemic, we, we, there was a lot of issues in London, especially, and then that was actually then filtered down into other cities. I mean, we've had to fight for our local bus routes. The problem you've got with private uh, operators is that they all want to run on main arteries into the city center. And the, they leave the branches out where the real communities are. They leave the you know housing uh, uh, sort of uh, developments, that new developments, they leave them out. They leave the current, you know what I mean? Uh, 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 big sort of chunks of the city out of their route planning. And they only want to run where they where they see the profits. I think where you asked the question about free public transport, I think it was Luxembourg who was first uh, that actually went free, and then Malta I think also made the decision. Spain did actually come into it, but I think they only did uh, a small number of trains that they were offering free travel on. But it was Luxembourg who took the decision. I think where the argument there is is that. A lot of the, the the bus companies actually feel as though if we if, if if there is no real investment and we are not collecting any fares, then the the terms and conditions could actually be driven down, and 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 people would not be benefiting from uh, uh, the the revenue that they could be generating with small number of fares. So what they're saying is like, you know, I mean, a lot of the cities now have got maximum of two pound fare, wherever you go from A to B, uh, one pound for, for children. I mean, in Bradford, we've got one pound 20 for adults even after seven o'clock, you know what I mean, in, on, on some of the routes. So I think that's where the argument is that if we're not generating any of that, uh, you know, uh, revenue, then it could actually have a massive effect on people's terms and conditions. Uh, I think you're absolutely right, Helen, we are playing lip service to a lot of the stuff uh, that should be, we should be actually taken very, very seriously at this moment of time. And yes, you are right. We have to do a balancing act on, on, on some of our sectors because we've got a lot of members in some of the sectors, which actually, if we talk about energy, or fossil fuels at this moment of time. We've got a lot of members in there and, you know, Unite as a representative have to do a balancing act. But you're absolutely right. I mean, I'm sorry I missed your first question. I, I couldn't understand it because I think my computer was playing up and all like, like uh, you know, others. It, it just kept on jumping. Uh, but, you know, we have, to, we have to drive down the emissions. That is the real goal. And if we don't drive down the real, uh, you know, I mean, the the emissions, then we will be playing 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 a uh, paying a lip surf, uh, service to a lot of these uh, important issues. And I think, I think the main thing here is that you know we start off is it, the unions have to gather, or moment, uh, you know, momentum and support to tackle it from local authority point of view, from you know, uh, from the MPs to to councillors to uh, combine authorities uh, to, and then, you know, at the government level, you know, we've got to build that support up from grassroots levels. Because if we don't, then, you know, I, I can't see any change coming. Thank you so much, Taj. Um, we've got quite a few hands up. Uh, so I'm gonna carry on taking a, a round of threes. Uh, and I'm gonna bring John in. And then I think it's Lee, Lynn and Steve, and then Ken, and, and then I'll carry on in a bit. So John first. Yeah, hiya, thanks. Um, going back on to what Taj mentioned earlier about funding. Uh, in Wales at the moment, we've, we've got a Unite campaign going on back your bus route. And it's calling on the Welsh government to safeguard against cutting of bus routes in Wales. Currently, our bus uh, companies are receiving or supported uh, by funding called the Bus Emergency Scheme, and um, it's it's looking as if the, the Welsh government want to uh, pull out on that. And um, if they do withdraw, the Welsh government withdraw that funding, 
it's going to result in possibility of a calculation of about 30 to 45 bus routes in Wales being done away with and significant loss of jobs as well will we'll follow that. Um, it's going to have an effect on um, workers, um, workers' families, families and vulnerable people being able to um, get about without public transport. They'll be isolated in communities. And I think with that, the possible increase going back to the car being used again, what effect is that going to have on climate change and the, the impacts all around? Because electric vehicles are brilliant in most parts of Wales, but in some of the rural areas, the infrastructure is just not there to cater for them. So um, I do I do feel that uh, Unite campaign at the moment is a key one for us in Wales. Thank you. Thanks, John, for your contribution. Lynn or Steve or both of you? Yes, it was me. I, I think John actually. I think that was. 30 to 45 percent of bus routes that's my understanding so it's a lot more serious than it sounded uh but I, i'm a technologist i could talk all day about technologies so i'm going to try to not to but i would like to mention a couple of things one old proven technologies trolley buses and third rail electric trains which we know they work we could introduce them fairly easily uh, on the green hydrogen, the, that's, I don't think that's a problem because if you put a load of solar panels and, and wind turbines up, which we need for a green transition, there's times when they're producing far more electricity than we would use, and that's the ideal time to make the hydrogen. So I think that's, that's a bit of a red herring. But the two things I wanted to mention were, well, first of all, no mention of school buses, I notice. Well, every day, twice a day, there's huge traffic jams of Chelsea tractors batching out fumes. And you just think, why don't we have a decent school bus service that people want to use? And that's the other thing is... I don't think you will get people not to have cars because if you've got a family and you want to go somewhere and you've got all the stuff to take, you just have to have a car, really. The question is, how do you get people to not use them all the time, to not just jump into the car? And that needs very good public transport that's frequent, that's easy to use, that has reasonable fares. And I, I mean, I think maybe the, maybe it does need to be nationalised to do that. But I would, I mean, my main question for Taj is where do you think would be the best place to start putting pressure on to make something actually happen? There's no real reason why it can't happen. It's just that it doesn't happen. That's all I've got to say. Thanks, Steve. That's great. So next is Ken. Hello, um, I'm Ken from Cardiff Community Branch Unite. Um, Actually, a long time ago, I was a bus driver in for Cardiff Bus, um, but it's a long time ago. Um, yeah, one point about um, transport, I think, is is that you need to have developed the interchange between different modes of transport, and uh, so certainly for the cities, a metro approach is where you plan interchange between. Uh, buses and uh, trains or buses and light rail. And of course, the passenger is either walking or, or cycling to, to get to the, uh, to the station. So, and I think that's where the funding is, is important to, to have a framework where the bus operators fit in. We've got the benefit of uh, an arm's length bus company in Cardiff, but um, obviously in, other places like in the valleys, we've got um, stagecoach and uh, first bus, which are, you know, they're pretty big operators. So, and uh, I guess it's important that they, they're treated the same as uh, arm's length companies in terms of investment, but it'd be expected to, to be uh, willing to take on uh, technological change. We, we have some uh, 
uh, electric buses in in the city. And uh, I take your point out about uh, garaging and so on. I, I'd like to ask whether the manufacturing um, element is there in the in the transport plan because. This, these buses are imported, I believe. I may be wrong, but I thought they were. And then, of course, the batteries, we don't have any uh, capacity in, uh, in Britain, have we, really? Not for, not for, for heavy duty. So that's my, that's my point. I would just add, when I was uh, on the buses, um, we had an active trade union that um, took part in uh, local campaigning, but it seems to have gone. Um, they don't affiliate to the mm, Trades Council, mm. and it would be helpful for local transport union branches to be involved. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. So I've, I've still got Sarah, who's got her hands up. Before I bring in Sarah, I just want to see if there is anybody else who is going to want to contribute, because I'm conscious that we're coming to 7 p.m. So. Um, yeah, I can't see anybody else. So I'm just wondering, Taj, if, if you're okay, if I take Sarah and then I've got a point and then we'll bring you in for the last time. So yeah, thank you so much, Sarah. Would you like to go next? Thanks, I'll try to be quick. Um, yeah, I, I'm in a, I'm in Aberystwyth, which is a very rural area. So we have a whole different problem with our buses. But my point was actually about the fact that Unite represents a lot of industrial workers and a lot of community, and maybe the way for our different, um, we have a different. I uh, we're looking at things from a different aspect, and it. I know that Unite is keen to have workers assemblies. Um, I've been training as a facilitator and I'd really like to get involved in getting the, both sides of the union talking about how we move forward with a just transition. So. Thanks, Sarah. And I mean, just for the record, I don't think Unite at this stage is keen for workers' assembly, but that's something that our caucus is trying to bring forward as, you know, a new way to engage, not to replace existing democratic structures in the union, but really like a, a way of having dialogue, exploring the technology and the different um, solutions. So I'm just going to make my point now and then I'll bring Tash back. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I've certainly got a few thoughts about what people have said as well. So I'm really um, grateful for everybody's contribution. and. Uh, I actually live in a street where there's not that many cars, but the main reason is because people can't afford cars. Uh, and uh, I think, that, you know, on the point that uh, I think it was Steve that was making about we can't really shift people away from cars, even if we've got good public transport. I think there are solutions in terms of, you know, shared cars electric cars being available for people on occasion. So for example, if you want to do a big shopping and you need to use the car for that, or if you wanted to go on holiday for a little bit, then you could access a car, but not necessarily always own one. So I don't think that's necessarily uh, incompatible to, to have the two systems along each other. Certainly, we cannot have every single diesel and petrol car replaced by the electric cars because we would be, you know, mining uh, so much uh, precious metals to do that. That would be uh, problematic. Uh, but I guess, like my reflection was about, you know, what Taj was saying around, you know, the TUC report, uh, the public transport fit for uh, a climate emergency and that's a good read and there's good figures and good analysis and he's also talked about our as a union we sort of talk the talk but not necessarily walk the walk in terms of integrating the idea of climate justice into all of our transport campaigns and similarly i think it was terry uh, made the point about there's a lot of local communities and local groups that get involved into uh those transport campaign, whether they're like disability campaigners or women safety campaigners. But again, the sort of like climate justice element is not often at the forefront or an integral part of, of those campaigns. And 
In Liverpool, um, we've had uh, recent campaigns around uh, buses and a small victory actually, uh, which ended the, the model of private public partnership in which the, the council or the city region were stuck in. Uh, there was a consultation and uh, as a result of a lot of public campaigning, you know, they went for full public franchising, which is not public ownership, but there is more control uh, into, into how you allocate the franchises. And you could under that model actually have a, um, you know, sort of like publicly owned company getting the franchises if we wanted to. So that's a fair step. Interestingly, one of the group that was really active in that campaign was a renters union, ACON. Uh, obviously people will rent, tend to have lower car ownership and use more public transport, but they were really active in that campaign. And ACON was also involved in the Manchester campaign. So my point is we've got all those alliance possible between you know, trade unions, passengers, local communities, disabled people group, uh, women's safety groups, renters unions. I mean, this is such a, a, a big opportunity. So I guess my question for Taj is like, how do we get our own union unite, but also more widely the TUC for our union to collaborate, to, to you know, move to the next stage, enough of the reports, enough of the talks. Uh, you know, we need to move into a, uh, full public campaigning and I guess that two ideas I've got you know that maybe that's something we could pick up as a climate justice caucus working with you know unite uh, transport sectors is I think there will be two things that would be useful that are also maybe manageable that we could try to develop in the next period number one is a mapping of all those campaigns across the country because we haven't got this information in one place. And to be able to see you know, where there are unite branches in transport, uh, where there are like campaigns around buses, around train, et cetera, will be like really useful for our members to be able to refer to or get involved with. And secondly, I think it would be great to see at some stage a sort of like, you know, unite transport conference that will put climate justice at, at the heart, as well as the other issues that we've um, we've mentioned, but that, you know, would be a conference that's not just for workers in the sector, but also for UNITE members more widely and uh, campaigners would be invited to as well. Sorry, I've rambled for far too long, but Taj, I'm gonna invite you to uh, come back to the group for one last time uh, before we sort of move on to uh, closing and conclusion. Thanks, Clara. I think it's not about just rumbling on. I think it's about passion. And I think you're passionate about the, 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 the uh, climate justice. And that, that's why. Um, John, just coming back to your, your point of funding. Yes. Um, when, we, when we had COVID, I mean, at one point before COVID, we used to have what was called VSOG. And there was grants that were actually given to uh, uh, bus companies and bus operators to actually operate uh, and, and, and they would actually get, you know I mean, relief on, on uh, fuel. That all stopped uh, and then COVID hit and then we had the uh, uh, COVID funding. And that COVID funding, you know, be under no illusion, a lot of the operators made uh, profits out of that because they were running less services. They were paying their, their, their employees only 80% of their wages, which was paid by the government. So there was no wages paid for, for, a, for a very long time. Also, any of the contractual work that they actually had won, whether that was school, baths, or private work, they, those, the schools were off, kids were not taken to uh, uh, swimming baths, uh, but they were still getting paid full money out of that. And then the government decided that when we were coming out of COVID, and, you know, so they changed it to burst emergency funding, which was to rebuild the companies and, 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 and the, uh, the, the depots uh, and, and rebuild confidence in the bus sector to bring back the uh, 
passengers. But what they haven't done is put the bus services back to, uh, to pre-COVID uh, levels. They're still running the bus, you know, COVID level uh, bus services, uh, but they want to grow passengers and you don't grow passengers by cutting bus services. We saw a lot of money plowed into active travel, whether that's walking or cycling. A lot of money was plied, plowed into that. We do have money coming in now for bus priority routes. So you see these little you know, corridors of, uh, of main roads where there's congestions and they have a, a separate lane for buses uh, to, to encourage people when buses is, is flying past you, when you're stuck in traffic to say, well, if that's flying past me, and that's the whole idea of actually having that. But it all comes back to my point that there isn't real funding being plowed into public transport. And unless we actually plow into real funding and long-term funding, it's not about you know, short-term funding, it's about long-term funding. And if unless we do that, then we're not going to have a public transport fit for purpose. Steve, that's a very long time ago when we used to run the trolley buses. You know, we've still got some of the routes uh, that they, the trolley buses used to run on. Uh, we explored them about 10 years ago to see if we could actually bring back the trolley buses. Unfortunately now, because it's a shared, shared routes, you know what I mean? So the trolley buses that used to run, a lot of those roads have actually now been redesigned. Uh, so because the trolley bus rather, you know, you run it in a straight line, but a lot of the routes have actually been re redesigned. A lot more traffic lights have actually come in. A lot more, you know what I mean? A lot of more, there were a lot of roundabouts put in. Uh, and, and, and also there's uh, more traffic on the, uh, on the roads now. So I think the trolley buses, yes, you know, you could run them today. You know, if you put them on, they run, run on electric. Best way of actually doing it. But I think it's uh, one, you would have to redesign a lot of the routes. You would have to dig up a lot of the roads and you would have to give priority to, to trolleybuses uh, on, on a, a lot of the busy routes. You're absolutely right about solar panels and wind farms. I think, you know what I mean? When, when, when you generate electricity from there, a lot of the people actually uh, who are big you know, houses and they can put a lot of solar panels on their houses, when they, when they generate electricity from there, they can sell it back to the grid. But there's a new initiative now by the government, and and it, which is which is you know uh, uh, as much as I hate the Tories, you know that has come in now, where they are building uh, battery banks next to substations. So a lot of the places they might be private lands, but they are renting it for next fifty years, and what they're doing is they're building like big sheds and putting batteries in there. So when there is generation of electricity currently it just goes to waste because we can't capture it what they're doing now is they want to capture that electricity put it in the uh, battery banks and when there is demand is high they will just put it back into the grid uh, and i think uh you know that then would solve some of the problems but i don't think it's going to bring the prices down so don't don't jump out of your seat for for bringing the prices down steve uh but I think the pressure has to be firstly on politicians because that's where the pressure should actually be applied. So when people are asking for votes and when people are canvassing out, you know, whether they are local politicians or they are national politicians, we should be putting the pressure on them that what is their stance on climate justice and climate emergency. And I think, you know, I mean, they have to commit to that. And then we can hold them accountable afterwards if they actually, you know what I mean, don't fulfill their promise. So that's where I think. But at the same time, there is a lot of local authorities that we can put pressures on, who can put pressure on the uh, combined authorities or like the T TFL or others to make sure that, you know, public transport is greener. I think that's where the pressure should, should be applied. Ken, I think what you were talking about is uh, mass, uh, you know what I mean? Mobility as a service, whereas everything should be in one place. 
you know, whether it's a train station, whether it's a bus station, whether it's a taxi rank, or whether it's, you know, active travel. I mean, I sit on the transport committee and we t t deal with a lot of the uh, uh, railway stations. And everywhere where we are actually upgrading the railway stations, I'm asking for uh, easy access, disabled access, and also uh, parking facilities for uh, bicycles. So people can actually do that last mile rather than in a car, right? They can do it either walking or cycling. So I think cycling should be encouraged. And I think a lot of the manufacturers are looking at manufacturing electric buses now because they think that's the, what the future it holds for them. But manufacturing an electric bus and getting the technology right is, is, is a massive issue at this moment of time. We haven't got the capacity because a lot of the, the manufacturers cannot guarantee you how many miles you're going to get out of that battery. Because I think, I can't remember who was saying, I think it was uh, you, John, that electric buses are okay in some parts of Wales, but not in the other parts of Wales. I'm sorry if I got it wrong, if it was somebody else. But yes, some buses are good in cold, some buses are good in the hot weather, some buses, you know what I mean? But it depends on, on, on what the uh, geography of that area is. If it's too many uphills, it'll use a lot more uh, uh, you know, I mean, battery, I think, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Sarah, I think it was yourself who, who said it, my, my apologies, yeah. And so therefore, also, you know, every single electric bus comes with a, a air conditioning uh, fitted to it. And first thing that they do is they remove the belts from the air conditioning unit. So you can't use the air conditioning because if you use the air conditioning unit, you're using a lot of the battery power and that give, then does not give you uh, a lot of the mileage that they are actually looking for. So there, there's not enough efficiency in there. And that's where the actually problem is. Now, the Chinese are actually trying to, you know, the Chinese manufacturers of batteries are actually trying to find, you know, I mean, refine that, that, that technology. But I think it's going to take a very long time to actually get the batteries to an acceptable level where we want them. Uh, like every other technology when it's first invented, you know, what I mean, there's always teething problems. And I think uh, somebody talked about just transition. I think, yes. I think just transition is, like I said, you know, what I mean, the where the current doesn't suffer and the future benefits. That's where just transition should lie. You know, we cannot have, you know, transition period where you make the current people who are in the industry or, or, or are, you know what I mean, dependent on that industry to suffer just because you want to make something better for the future. You've got to carry everybody uh, along with you. And I think that's where the just transition is. Um, Clara, there are a number of avenues that are available to us. The first one is the policy conference because the union does have to have a policy the members have to vote on a policy that union must actually act upon. You know, so if we want the union to actually uh, be more vibrant in this area, then we've got to have a policy on it. I think, you know, currently, I think any branch, whether it's a community branch even, they can actually send, and I think our next policy conference, I mean, I'm, I, we haven't got uh, 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 the opportunity this time round but any opportunity, any any branch. Now, uh, I think Sanford uh, from Suffolk is, is shaking his head. I'm not really sure about whether the community branches can actually send a policy, uh, you know, I mean, motion to the policy conference. But it might be that you could actually join forces with a, a local workplace branch and maybe actually encourage them to send that, you know, I mean, uh, a motion to, to policy conference next time around. Then, you know, uh, branches can, yeah, unite branches or, or might not be able, uh, sorry, community branches might not be able to, but other unite branches can send motions. The risks, so especially transport, whether it's, you know, I mean, whichever area it is, but any transport branch should be looking at this and sending a motion. And, and, and also, if we know people who sit on regional committees, they are very powerful also if they were to send motions. So those are the avenues available to us to actually send motions. I'm sure 
that you know there will be branches sympathetic to uh, to 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 this cause uh, uh, to send uh, motions to the policy guard and even i mean you know some of us that are going to uh, to the policy conference i'm sure people will actually talk about you know i mean uh, climate emergency and climate justice I, I, I cannot see people not talking about it in their speeches at some point. If not, I will definitely be. Thank you so much, Taj. And uh, you'll be pleased to hear that our caucus has organized uh, and we, are su we have submitted two motions through our branches and risk. Uh, one is focused on uh, no new fossil fuels. And the other one is about workers' assemblies because you know, we do believe that we need to take each sectors uh, with us uh, on that. And, you know, that may be a way of, you know, if there was a workers assembly in this of uh, your sector, that may be, you know, a way to, to move things forward. And um, I don't know if there is also sectorial conferences, but that's something that, you know, we could work towards. Uh, certainly the caucus would be interested to, you know, have a fringe at uh, your sector conference uh, if you organize any. And there is also the Unite Community Conference, which hasn't got the same weight in terms of, you know, policy making. But I think that something for us to consider is at the next Unite uh, Community Conference to have, you know, a carefully crafted motion to encourage um, a, a big campaign on, on public transport working in partnership with the industrial branches uh, in, the, in the sector, so. Okay, I think that we've gone way past time in terms of uh, the big group discussion. I mean, I'm gonna take a temperature check, but I don't assume that, you know, people want to now go into breakout rooms, but I, I'll just pause there. And if, if you would like to go in breakout rooms uh, in your region, can you please raise your hand now? Clara, sorry to interrupt. Can I also say, put it in the chat, uh, if everyone's got their ballot papers for the political fund, could you please vote and send them back? <laughs> Thanks, Angela. That's a good point. I think the deadline is, is it the 23rd of May? So you may have like less than a week to do so. But yeah, thanks for reminding us. I did post mine a couple of days ago. Okay, I cannot see many hands of enthusiasm for breakout rooms. I think that's been a really productive session. It's been really interesting. We have been able to record it as well. So we'll be able to share it to the, the rest of people in the caucus. Uh, and I suggest that you know the, the people from the, the community branches who uh, led on this session and came up with the idea of holding the session, we can reconvene to uh, look at the next step, whether we want to have a bit of a strategy session on our next steps. Um, oh yeah, how we take that forward. Uh, we will come back to everybody. It's been absolutely brilliant to have you. Uh, I did post a couple of events coming up uh, shortly uh, in the chat, but all the links that we share in the chat are gonna be circulated by email in the next week. But next Tuesday, which is the 23rd, there is an online event uh, about, um, I can't find it in the chat now because too many people have posted things. Oh yeah, it's buses, the sustainable uh, transport solution, uh, why we need better buses for all. So that's Tuesday the 23rd of May at 7 p.m. We will circulate the registration link. And then also in June the 17th, there is a national bus conference campaigning for outstanding bus service. So it'd be good to have some of us going there and talking about the link with uh, climate justice. It will be in New York in person, but also available on, on, on uh, Zoom. Okay, well, I will let you get on with the rest of your evening. Uh, I just want to thank John for introducing the session and sharing the first part. Again, thanks so much to Taj. You've been absolutely brilliant and we definitely want to hear from you again. And thank you for all the people who attended and contributed. Uh, have a lovely evening and we will see you, hopefully some of you, at our next session of the Unite Grassroots Climate Justice Caucus, which is in two weeks time. And that session will be dedicated 
to the policy conference, how we organize to make sure that the voice of climate justice is present. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity. See ya.